Bob Murphy Show, episode 323. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Bob Murphy Show. Today I'm going to be speaking with Ed Maybree, who I first saw on The Mark Clare Show. And Ed runs the platform called Faith by Reason. So his official bio, he says, Ed Mabry is a truth seeker, researcher, and Christian. He created Faith by Reason to help people understand how the Bible and Christian philosophy make sense using logic, reason, and systematic analysis. And I should mention, Ed states repeatedly, you know, on his on his website that he's not religious. Okay, meaning, you know, he's a man of faith. He believes in God and in Jesus, but he doesn't adhere to man-made religions, right? So he uh, makes that distinction in terms of the way he parses these terms. So I think you're going to like this conversation if this is the sort of thing that's up your alley. Uh, Ed gives his background in the beginning and explains you know, that he actually felt ill-equipped from his tr- standard upbringing to answer objections to Christianity leveled by agnostics and or atheists. And so that put him on the journey and brought him to where he is today. So I think it's very interesting, my conversation with Ed Mabry. Ed, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Thanks for having me, Bob. I really appreciate it. Well, I, as I would have already said in the pre-recorded introduction, I learned of you because I saw you on the Mark Clare Show, and I thought, I need to poach that guest. And so <laughs> here you are. So maybe just to, in your own words, explain to the listeners, how is it, for example, you have a podcast or a blog called Faith by Reason. Right. So can you just explain, how did you get into this space, for lack of a better term? Sure, yeah. So my, my website is faithbyreason.net. And the way I got into it, I'll, I'll give you as much as I can of the Reader's Digest version of it. So born and raised um, in, in a Christian household, uh, went to church my whole life. But um, I also, just as, as, as a kid, I also had a very inquisitive mind and a very scientific mind, I believe. And if you were to ask my parents, you know, what, what my first word were, was, they would say, my first word was why. I was always asking why. Why does this happen? Why does that happen? How does this work? Why does it work this way? And, you know, drove them nuts. And I I have the, I think I, I've received the curse that every parent gives their child when they say, you know, hope when you have a kid, he grows up, grows up to be just like you. And I have a 10-year-old son who is always asking me why and driving me nuts. So mm-hmm. I got kind of got the payback. But that whole questioning thing and asking why uh, it, it extended to church and so i would always ask the pastor you know why because there, there are some things in the bible that are frankly strange mm-hmm. so why did god flood the world and kill everybody you know why did jesus have to die you know wh- why did you know david kill goliath with a rock how did and eventually they kind of got tired of me asking all these whys and they just basically said you know it's not right to question god and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to make God mad. So I'll just, you know, I'll leave it alone. But what that resulted in was me going through my youth and adolescence, not really challenging my own beliefs and kind of being in an echo chamber, being in the church, being in a community, you know, obviously I'm African-American. I grew up in South Central LA and African-Americans are, you know, by large, the, the most church going demographic. So even in, even in school, uh, go. I went to private school, Christian school, but then I also went to a secular high school, but I, it still, it was never challenged directly. So then I get to college, went to a secular college, got good grades, got into a good school. And that all changed because not only, I, I, now I wasn't expecting a secular school to promote my faith, but I was not expecting the level of hostility mm-hmm. that, um, that I received. A openly hostile and it's my professors and even my fellow students took delight in trying to deconstruct what I believe. You know, they would say things like, you know, you can't, the Bible isn't trustworthy. It's not historically accurate. It's not scientifically accurate that the God of the Bible, Yahweh or Jehovah is nothing more than an Hebrew appropriation of ancient Canaanite deity, uh, of vengeance deities. And, you know, there was no such thing as Jesus. Jesus was just someone, someone they made up because they just took 
all the old stories of Ra and Osiris and Horus, and they just kind of renamed these these uh, these deities as Jesus because he has all the same characteristics of of being you know a, 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 a rising I'm sorry a dying and rising God, and because I my faith was never challenged and I never researched it, I got destroyed. I had no answers for them, so mm -hmm. I left college really shaken in my faith. I never stopped believing in God because I thought the alternative was even more ridiculous. And we may get into that in this show because, you know, the whole uh, secular evolutionary paradigm of everything being the result of trillions of accidents happening, beneficial accidents happening, didn't sit right with me as well. I either, but what I began to question is what I was taught about God. And so I started drifting and getting into other, I wouldn't say I got into other religions, but I started, started studying other um, other faiths, other belief systems, other worldviews, because I, I just wanted truth. That's who I am. I'm a, I'm a truth seeker. But what that did was it, it actually led me back to my Christian faith because my prayer to God was, okay, look, if you were real and if your worldview was real, then it should conform to logic and reason because that means you would have created logic and reason. It should not be a, a blind faith. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God honored that request and led me to research and to people who reaffirmed that what I believe and what I've been taught actually does make sense, not just on blind faith, but logically and reasonably and scientifically. And so I put together faith by reason because I figured that there were Christians and even non-Christians who were on the same journey as I was on and who, and who were scientific thinkers and who were rational, logical thinkers and wanted to see how and why this faith that we have actually makes sense. And that's and that's brings us to where we are today. Okay, great. Um, let me ask a clarifying question. Sure. If so, I'll say two different statements, and you can either say which one is basically where you're coming from, or if neither of them are great or is great, you can give me a a better formulation. But there's at least two possible things I could see for someone in your vein. Is one is to say, yes, if you know, if God exists, if if Jesus really was the Messiah and so forth, if the, if the basic stories Liz laid out in the Christian Bible are true, then re correctly done reason and empiricism and science or whatever terms you may use, isn't going to contradict any of that because assuming that those are re reliable mechanisms for discovering truth, um, but still just the, the quote, if you want to learn Christianity, whatever, you should study the Bible and listen to pastors as opposed to reading Niels Bohr's work. So there's that, or I could see someone making a stronger point that, that no, like studying, even if you didn't know anything about the Christian Bible, if you really just followed where the evidence led, you might not know that the guy's name was Jesus, but like you would really, a lot of the doctrines of Christianity actually pop out of our framework and are really the only worldview that makes sense. Um, I would say it's a little bit of both, depending on which, okay. where you enter, because I enter from the first where I your 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 first uh, synopsis, where mm -hmm. you know I had that belief, and then I said you know it, it, it should conform. But also, I think if you come at it from, and I I I, I know people who, and you know very famous people who like uh, you know Lee Strobel and others who came from the other. Uh, direction where they were not believers, but logic and reason and just studying saying there has to be something more than this. And again, it may not, it may not take me to the names of Jesus or Jehovah or anything like that, but I know that there has to be a creator. Right. Mm -hmm. I know that this world could not come into existence by accident. I know that creator has to be right and just because, you know, righteousness, rightness and justness exist independently and things like that. I, I, I get, I've had people ask me before, um, you know, how is it fair that let's say someone in the jungles of wherever, who's never met a missionary, never read a Bible, how mm -hmm. could, you know, God judge them or send them to hell or heaven if they never knew about him? Does, does that make sense? And I would tell them, well, you have to look at some of the fundamental things that you know, whether or not you've ever seen a Bible. And one of those things you know is that this world was it wasn't an accident you know that accident beneficial accidents don't create you don't get something out of nothing mm -hmm. they know that they they all believe that that's there was a creator they believe that there's also good and evil they no one no one questions whether good and evil exists and they know that they are not always good 
they know that they everyone knows that they do things that are bad that are selfish or, or whatever reason and they so they assume that whomever this creator is is good and that they can't be good on their own and so if they appeal to this creator and say you know you're good i'm not help me i mean they've in essence prayed what you know christians call the sinner's prayer so you can get to 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 and god will honor that i think you know god will meet you where you are so i i think you can still get to god without having you know, a formal bible because we, we can look at how many people in history haven't had one i mean the our Bible is a relatively recent, I wouldn't say invention, but relatively a, a recent uh, codex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have, so people have come to belief in, in God without it. But I think if you have it, you have a greater responsibility because you have greater answers. And um, you, you, but that also means you have the privilege of knowing him better because the Bible is, a lot of people look at the Bible one of two ways. They look at it as either a textbook or some type of guide to life. They make the Bible about us. The Bible isn't about us. If, if, if it is, if the Bible is supposed to be a textbook on history or biology, it it's, does a terrible job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the creation narrative, it's only a couple of chapters in Genesis and you know, a little bit in Job and a few other places. It's not a comprehensive science book. It's not a comprehensive biology book. What it is, it's a it's a set of stories that tell a big story, and this it's basically the Bible is Jehovah's story. And why do you want to know His story? So that you can know Him. That's the reason He gave us the, the His Word is so that we can know Him personally and intimately. So if you have that, then you have the ability to know Him more personally and intimately. But if you don't have it, you can still know Him based on nature. With the the um, the Psalm, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you just if you if you see nature, if you see beauty in nature, and I, I know I'm talking about, it, I'll I'll let you chime in in a second. But when I, I I've talked to people who are unbelievers, and they will they'll argue with me about you know there's no God, it's not logical, blah blah blah. You know it's 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 the evolutionary paradigm. We came from accidents. And I was I ask you I'll ask them a question. I'm like, do you believe in beauty? Have you ever seen anything that you would say is beautiful? They say yeah, okay. You know mountains, trees, flowers. Like great. What is beauty? Beauty is our recognition of symmetry. That's what it is. If something is symmetrical, it is appealing to us and we consider it beautiful. On the other hand, if something is unsymmetrical, chaotic, it's it's not. It's 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 not appealing to us. We don't consider it beautiful. Here's the thing: symmetry is order. Order cannot come from chaos. That is scientifically impossible. That violates the second law of thermodynamics, among other things. So if you see beauty, you see symmetry. If you see symmetry, you see order. If there is order, there is intelligence. Order is intentional. So when you tell me that you believe in beauty, you're telling me that you believe that that beauty came from intelligence because it cannot come from chaos. That is a contradiction and contradictions can't exist. So a flower, so by, by that notion, a flower can show us the existence of a God. Okay, great. Yes. And it definitely, I'm excited to get in all this stuff with you because it's what you're doing dovetails a lot with some of the stuff I've been doing and talking about on this podcast. Uh, just to illustrate, so it seemed like your answer to my question before was a little of both that, you know, you if you started out as a Christian, uh, nothing you're going to learn in the natural sciences or history or whatever, as long as it's correct, is going to contradict what what you you know, which makes sense if if Christianity is true. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but then even again, going the other way that even if you didn't have the Bible, you could, you know, if the universe was designed by the God of the Bible, then we would expect studying his creation would lead us to some conclusions about his nature or something yes. like that. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. What, cause what I've found too, I don't know if this will resonate with you, Ed, is mm -hmm. that sometimes, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe and like, who couldn't like the Sermon on the Mount and that, that kind of like, oh, Jesus is such a nice guy. But then there's certain things in the Bible that are a little bit, eh, you know, you don't fully understand. Or yeah. like you said, like, why would Jesus have to die? Like, geez, that seems like a, why, why did the plan involve that? But then, yeah. so I'm, I'm trying to understand that. And then I start going down and I thought, well, if maybe if part of what that is, is showing that good is more powerful than evil that, you know, God, God can kind of say, no, just have faith in me and trust me in the end, everyone will agree that the person who, you know, kept their fidelity to me was triumphed, 
regardless of the wiles of Satan or whatever. Like, if it didn't come down to the worst possible thing that could ever happen on earth is that Satan tricked us into murdering and torturing and murdering yes, God's torturing son. Yeah, yeah. And then yet that be- gets flipped and becomes the centerpiece of our salvation. Like, that is like almost like logically you couldn't imagine a better demonstration of how no matter what Satan does, God can defeat him using love and mercy and blah, 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 you know? And so when I go through that, then it's like, well, he obviously had to, like, it couldn't have been any other way. So it's not just, wow, this is a really awkward fact that I'm squeamish about, but it's more like, how could it have been anything otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. But then I wonder, am I just tricking myself? Cause like, that's what I want the answer. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's weird. Yeah. 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 No, I'm with you. I, I, Mm -hmm. When I ask these questions, you know, why did these, yeah, why did he have to be tortured to death? Why can he, you know, the worst possible death at that time, you can imagine to the, you could even say to this day, that's a you know pretty rough way to go out. But when you consider that it was, well, two things, I, I the, the death had to happen because of what, you know, the, he, he was in our place. Mm-hmm. We, we die because of sin. So he had, as a sinless person, would have to die. So that's that's actually logical. It's like it's, um, I, I I give the example. Let's say that you know I commit a crime. Um, I, I'm at my house. I I kill someone. I deserve to go to jail for that or get the death penalty, whatever, depending on the state you're in. And, and I hear the police sirens. They're on their way. They're coming to get me. But right before the police get there, my father comes along, and he says, "What happened?" I say, "You know, I I, I killed this guy." He says, "Okay, look, I love you so much. I don't want you to to go to jail for this." So when the police get here, I'm going to tell them that I did it. I'm innocent. I don't deserve to go to jail, but I'm going to go to jail in your place. So my dad shouldn't have to go to jail for me, mm-hmm. but he loved me so much that he took my transgression onto himself. And my response to that should be, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to live for my dad. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, first of all, I'm, I'm going to not do these, this crime again. But I'm also going to appreciate and love and 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 be there for my, for my dad to whatever degree I can. That's that's basically what we're talking about with Jesus. He didn't deserve to die. He did it for us because we deserved that punishment. So then, okay, well now that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah, this is yeah. so we're, we're, is a good thing that you and and someone who had a because you know, I've heard people say what you said and then critics saying, okay, but you know, God has the whole system. Like, why couldn't God have just forgiven us? Like why, but I'm saying because partly in terms of what I was trying to add to Mm -hmm. that, to what you said too, was because if nothing really bad happened, then someone might say, oh sure. In this particular universe, good seems like it's better than evil or something, but I can imagine really bad things in which case, you know, you Christians would look pretty stupid, or, you know, or foolish. Well, yeah. And so I'm saying in this sense, it's like, no, the, the, let's take the worst case scenario. <laughs> the, the, you know, the savior of humanity shows up, he's going around healing people, giving wise sermons, and we torture him and murder him and spit on him. And then God forgives us and says, that's the basis of your salvation. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> like, I mean, here's just, the thing. If, if, if God didn't punish sin, he would, he would be mm-hmm. unjust. Mm-hmm. So God just can't ah, he, ah, let it go. He, no, yeah. there is again. That's a law of the universe. A, an objective law is that is is the you know justice is is a universal law that there everything has to equal out. If you have mm-hmm. any type of deficit, it has to be made up in some way. We see that you know if you no matter what happens, everything has to balance out. I mean that's what justice is. So God can't be unjust. So if something is wrong, something has to happen to, if something is taken, something has to be given back. Yep. Yep. So do you, maybe now, uh, as far as, cause I, I heard your discussion on, on Mark's show that I know you're familiar with a lot of, um, cutting edge scientific discoveries and how you think that I look at this is just confirming like someone with a biblical worldview, one might, a, a, a cynic might have thought, Oh yes, the more we learn, the more we realize this stupid old book that Shepherds wrote is outdated. Yeah. But you're arguing, if I understand correctly, that no, actually, the more we learn, the more we realize that yep, yep. If you had a biblical worldview, this is just more confirmation. Exactly. Yeah. The more we learn from from actual science, the more this you know dusty old book that you said written by a, you know a bunch of of Hebrews and you know two thousand or more years ago. Wow, this it actually lines up with it. And it's it's amazing. And yeah, so I, I, I'm into that and it, it, it affirms my faith all the time. 
So, yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, do you want to take a specific sure. example? Yeah. So let's let's just talk about the creation narrative. Sure. Because here, here's the thing, and I think I, I wrote to you about this before we, we got on, 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 on this broadcast, is that, you know, there's this so-called war between faith and science, which I think is a, is a complete farce. It's, it's a misnomer because that assumes that faith and science are opposing worldviews. That's not true. Faith is a worldview. Science is not. The definition of science, science is a tool for understanding reality. It's a set of tools, actually, for understanding our reality. That's all it is. It's not a worldview. It's not subjective. Now, there is a secular worldview that, you know, again, that is in opposition to a faith worldview. So those are two opposing worldviews. But one of them, the secular worldview, claims monopoly on science, that, which simply isn't true. Again, science is just a tool. So the question is, whose worldview is closer to the scientific tools of the objective scientific tools that we already have? So let's look at the basics of, of those two worldviews. The one worldview is the, 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 the biblical worldview which states that, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he, cre so he, he created the, phys the, the, the heavens or the spiritual realm. He created apparently with a thought. And then our physical world, when you read the, uh, the Genesis narrative, he spoke it into existence. He used words to speak it into existence. So again, yeah, sounds a bit fanciful, but that's, that, that's one worldview. The other worldview is that, you know, there was some type of singularity at the, at the beginning of time. And it, it was an explosion. And that, that's, that singularity had all the potential energy and matter in it. There was an explosion over time. The, you know, it created the, all the, the, the forces of nature, the forces, the forces of thermodynamics and, and electromagnetism and gravity. And those acted on that matter and coalesced it through a series of, 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 of randomness into our stars and our planets. And then on this particular planet, we happen to be in this Goldilocks zone where we had, you know, liquid water and the right environment and amino acids, which, you know, became proteins, which became cells, which became multi-celled animals, which became fish, which became amphibians, lizards, monkey, man, sort of thing. So those are two worlds, which, ones, which one conforms most to science? Well, what do we know scientifically about the basic building blocks of our what we consider our physical reality well, we have the atom we, we we've seen we've all seen the the, the niels bohr uh, model of the atom which you know there's some problems with it but it's, it's still pretty accurate overall where you have the nucleus in the center protons and neutrons and surrounding it you have a certain number of electrons negatively charged uh depending on the element now of course we when we see that in in our textbooks in school it's not to scale it couldn't be it wouldn't fit in the textbook because the scale of the ratio of the distance between the nucleus and the electrons is about a hundred thousand to one so and I, and I think I, I gave this example um on, on mark show that if you were to put it to scale if you were to you know take an ink pen and put a dot at the 50 yard line of a, of a football stadium then the electrons would be rotating through the either end zone. So that's a huge amount of space. That's a huge, you know, it's gigantic. It's mo so most of the atom is just 99.9% .9 nothing. If you were to, to enlarge the nucleus to the, say the size of a softball, the electrons will be, uh, will be orbiting like about seven miles away in, in diameter. So huge, huge uh, disparity in space. So it's mostly nothing. The, and the electron itself, it's almost weightless. I mean, it's, its weight is implied by its motion. So, you know, so, it, but the reason we have, so it, if the building blocks of our existence are mostly nothing, then why, why do this, why does things seem solid? Why am I not fall, falling through this chair, which is because we're all made of atoms was well, because of the electrostatic charge that we get from the negative charge of the electrons. They, because you have these trillions of electrons, they have a, a, a strong magnetic uh, electromagnetic force, which repels the other electromagnetic forces. So the, the, the electrons that make up the the outer part of the atoms of the chair I'm sitting in repel the ones that are that make up my butt so I don't fall through the chair. So it's basically an illusion. But when you get down to the protons and neutrons, now they actually do have weight, but when you get down to the subatomic particles that make them up, the the uh, the quarks, which is what they're called, they're so small they don't even have a, a um, you know they don't really have a, a color or anything like that. What they are, they're basically vibrations. Quarks, so at the fundam the most fundamental level, level, the smallest level that we have are when we look at what makes up our existence, they're vibrations and light. The electrons, electric charge are basically light. 
their electric spark and you have well they're, they're not, i don't want to say that because someone who's listening to your show is very scientific will disagree with that so let's say there you have an electric charge and you have vibrations but we also have order in our universe so what would you call an ordered vibration well vibration sounds mm -hmm. what are ordered sounds words how does the Bible say that this universe came into existence, our physical universe? It was spoken into existence. So what ma what matches closer to, re to reality? That ordered words, vibrations, were spoke that the, the world was spoken into existence through this order? Or does it make more sense that it, that it was chaotic? And somehow that chaos became order, which violates the second law of thermodynamics. And the fact that it could, or the idea that, that something could come from nothing violates the first law of thermodynamics. So in order to believe the secular point of view, you have to violate at least two, I would say you can violate all three laws of thermodynamics. You have to violate the laws of causality. You have to violate the laws of conservation of angular momentum. And I can go on and on. Whereas for the biblical worldview to be true, well, all you have to do is look at quantum physics, which you know is a relatively recent discovery over the last hundred years, but it shows that we are ordered vibrations Order vibrations or words, the Bible says that God spoke it into existence. Now, does that mean that quantum physics proves biblical creation? No, what it shows is that it doesn't disagree with it. You can't disprove it. And it actually, you can actually say that there, you, you can actually use it as a point of circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because I think a secular person hearing that would be like, oh, give me a break. You got, but you could stop and say, well, hang on though. If by stipulation, you know, God is speaking the physical universe into existence, clearly that doesn't mean there was an old guy with a beard speaking and air molecules were vibrating and he said in English, let there be light. <laughs> that's clearly not what that could mean. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's not, it doesn't have to mean that in order for Genesis to be true, clearly. And so, you know. Yeah. Well, again, like I said, it's circumstantial. Mm -hmm. evidence but but you know but if you have enough circumstantial evidence you have to say well you know what this sounds closer to truth i wasn't there when he spoke it into existence but what again what matches closer to our tools of reality and in fact not not only did he speak it you could actually argue that he sang it into existence because the first the creation narrative is in stanzas in in the bible and if you again as you said if he didn't say it in english because english didn't exist in 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 hebrew um, when you see things in stanzas, that means it's it's intended to be sung. Hmm. Now, why is that? In, wh what does that matter? Why does that matter? It matters because when you put words into songs, it causes vibrations. It, it causes the vibrations to resonate with um, with matter in very interesting ways. If you look at some of the work of a scientist by the name, I forget his first name. His last name is Hami uh, Ahamid Toz. Yeah, Ahamid Toya, I believe. I totally butchering his name. He's a Japanese scientist. He was experimenting with sounds, with songs, and how they affect water molecules. And he mm -hmm. showed that, you know, songs that are about love, that are singing in the right key, actually makes the water uh, form very um, beautiful, harmonious shapes. Negative words did the opposite. Yeah, so I, I'm in familiar songs, with, that, with our yeah. DNA. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm familiar with that too. Like, because I know there was also, I don't know if it was the same guy where, like, if you play not classical music for your plants, they grow better than if you play mm -hmm. like, you know, jump off a bridge music for your plants, which, you know, so some people might think, oh, that's new age, hippy dippy stuff and not believe it. But even, if, but if that were true, I think people could say, okay, yeah, I, I could kind of see why that might be the case. But to talk about something that's inorganic, like just water, mm -hmm. like that is, is sort of surprising. But that, but what's funny is, from a secular point of view, you could push them and say, why? According to you, there's nothing magical about life. It's just right. a particular arrangement that there's this epiphenomena, like the, you know, the, the hydrogen and helium atoms forming a plant are just the same as that form a rock. So why would you think if music can affect a plant, why wouldn't it affect a rock or water? It's all atoms, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's all molecules, as you said. And again, our, our, our DNA, these are some recent studies that I'm still getting into. So I, I'm not going to say that this is the absolute truth, but some studies that I, I've been reading talk about how you know, music and, and our voice and vibrations resonate in our DNA and that our DNA actually uh, vibrates at certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. And I just find that, that in fact, there, the supposition is that all the elements on the periodic table 
conform to a, a, a key like you know some like i think oxygen is is i think it's, it's f sharp and i'm and so forth and so on so you so if we're made of vibrations it would actually absolutely make sense and then again this isn't um th this is science i mean the 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 idea that at the quantum level the quarks are vibrations that's not that's not disputable well now our inference that you know that it has something to do with god now that's you know that's debatable but what's right. not debatable is that these are vibrations so if these are vibrations they're going to resonate with other vibrations that's just how actual science works that's not a world view vibrations um they resonate with each other and so that just totally makes sense and i guess that dovetails too with like the wave particle duality of you know it's like there's a sense in which electrons are vibrating and if there's positive or negative interference that can explain things and it's like yeah when you really push it down it's it's not just a bunch of billiard balls that are really small yeah. like that something breaks down with that it's really interesting i i was reading a study um about how in history um, you know, we're talking just a few hundred years ago, people would go into cathedrals for healing, not to have a priest lay hands on them, but just to be there with the organ music. And because they, a lot of these, um, not just cathedrals, but other buildings were, were built in a way that the sound would resonate in a way that would heal the body. Mm -hmm. And that, and that type of quote unquote technology isn't, I wouldn't say it was lost, but it was maybe covered up and getting my conspiratorial hat on. Um, and, but, but, I, I thought that was fascinating yeah. that you have that you ha you're in a building that's built in a certain way to have certain resonant frequencies and you go in there and you just you you, you feel better because your the, the resonant vibrations are healing you at at a DNA level. I just find that absolutely fascinating. So w w it seems like what part of what we're getting at here is um, what you're talking about is is colliding with other trains of thought that I've been talking about on this podcast that, and I'm so I'll just say it and get your reaction that I've been studying a lot of the in, intelligent design movement and a lot of those things. And it seems just like the fact that we say like atheist biologists without blinking will say that, Oh yes, the genetic code. <laughs> right. So like they, they talk right. about DNA as if it's software. Right. right. And, and so that, and then it's, you know, issue. And it's like, well, and I know some physicists, the cosmologists, who again are not, you know, Bible believing Christians or anything. Well, it's like a puzzle as to why is it that right after the Big Bang that was a very low entropy state? Like, why why should that have been the case? That you right. know, it makes sense that entropy increases over time, but there's a sense in which, in absolute terms or however you quantify it, that it, it's not just that why are the laws of physics the way they are, but like even given that they are, it's kind of amazing that the early microseconds of the universe were like they were. Because if they were otherwise, you know, just would have pizzled out and there would have been, you know, uniform gas or whatever, nothing interesting. And so I guess that's partly like it seems like there's uh, stuff that an outside observer who has preferences or something would, would look at this and see informational content packed into this, you know, soulless mechanism that is unfolding according to the blind laws of physics. Right. It's, it's so interesting that, that when you listen to someone who is an atheist biologist you were talking about as, as they explain what they do and what they believe you see so many blatant contradictions like you just said well there's a dna code but that came randomly wait mm -hmm. do you just see the contradiction what you just said you just said a code and you just said it happened randomly give me an give me an example of a code that's ever happened randomly can you reproduce that you can't that's that's when we get into empiricism empirical mm -hmm. science which is the you know, the most objective form of science states that something is empirically scientifically true or we can believe is true if you can observe it in nature or recreate it in a controlled or laboratory setting unfortunately the evolutionary paradigm doesn't conform to that at all the problem with i mean dna is in many ways the death nail or should have been the death nail for that secular point of view because with dna dna is digital it you know it's a four by three code and because it's because it's not analog, it's not random. Digital, you know, it's 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 in discrete it's in discrete digits. And because it's because it's in those digits, you can actually apply the mathematic the tool the scientific tool of math to it. And that has caused um, certain scientists who are honest with themselves to actually look at that and say, wait a minute, we have a serious problem here. There was one that I quote on my on my website. I, I do I have a whole a series on creation versus evolution um, on faithbyreason.net. And I quote several scientists, none of whom are Christians, 
some they're either agnostic or flat out atheists who have basically said that DNA disproves this. You know, uh, 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 Francis uh, Crick, you know, who's who discovered the, the DNA, he himself said the same thing that this cannot have happened by accident. We can do the the math and make and and and, and show that it's not. There was a scientist um, at the uh, famous for at, at Yale, uh, Hubert Yockey, who who uh, used math to show the odds of a single protein molecule occurring by random chance. And they uh, don't have it off the top of my head, but I mean, basically, I think it was um, one a chance in one in ten to the, like ten to the the one hundred and oh no, it's it's like ten to the two hundred and thirty or something like that. That means a, a one followed by two hundred and thirty zeros. That's mm -hmm. one chance in that many. The problem is that it's been established scientifically that anything that that has less than a chance of one in ten to the fiftieth is impossible. This is magnitudes higher than that. So basically, it's scientifically impossible using mathematics for a single protein molecule to form on its own. Yeah, and on, on that, that, those calculations, Ed, just so, to give the listener, my understanding too is it's not just the um, like the constituents of it, but the proteins to work have to be folded a certain way. Right. Exactly. And so, like when you're talking about, like if you look at the volume in which it's embedded, and say this the the space of all possible configurations the the ones that work that's what you're saying it's the, that's the one in the blah 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 like to just show people like what why it's so vanishingly small because it's not just that if, if the right amino acids or whatever came to it but it's also it has to be folded in the right way or else it doesn't yeah what, and that it, was the whole thing with dna right like it was the double right. helix like they they it took them a yeah, while to figure out way. i mean you see the structure. Even it gets even worse when you get down to the to the uh, the amino acid level because there are only twenty of all the amino acids. There's only twenty three that are part of life that that make up you know the the type of proteins we need. So the, so if you know in, in the evolutionary paradigm you have the idea that you know you have the the primordial Earth where it was you know covered all in water, and then you had these certain gases in the atmosphere you know uh, nitrogen, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, so forth and so on. And the idea is that there were storms. And lightning, the energy source, struck these, um, struck the, the the atmosphere, and that energy caused amino acids to form. They fell into the they fell into the water, and amino acids started, you know, basically you know, bumping into each other, having a big amino acid rave party in the water over millions and or billions of years. They they linked up and they formed protein because proteins are long strings of amino acids that you said folded in a certain way. But there's so many problems with that because again, only 23. Of, of the amino acids are uh, can, are responsible for life. The others, if they if they join, if, if any of those other amino acids join with the with any of those other twenty three, it's actually toxic. It's poison. Life life can't happen. And also, the biggest problem with it is that you know if you learn from in tenth grade chemistry that whenever two molecules come together and form a, a, a link, a bond, there's always always something given up. And if you want to break that bond, you introduce whatever molecule was given up and it breaks the bond. And molecules tend to, to break apart more easily, more readily than they form together. So what is, what is the molecule produced when two amino acids bond together? H2O, water. Which means if you want to break an amino acid bond, you introduce water to it. So they say amino acids fell into the ocean and formed these, these bonds. Well, what is the ocean made out of <laughs> it's made out of water so you're basically telling me that all these amino acids formed long chains to, to form proteins while in a pool of their own solvent that's it that's ludicrous mm -hmm. yet this is this is in textbooks i remember reading it in high school and in college that the amino acids formed proteins in water when water is the absolute worst medium you could possibly have to form long chains of amino acids because they would break apart right after they joined so so yeah, the, the more you study the evolutionary paradigm, the more ludicrous it becomes. Yeah, I was uh, recently listening to a a podcast uh, episode between I, I forget what the guy's name was, but he he I was on the origin of life stuff, and so he was. I don't know if he became religious over time, but my I believe he actually started out just secular, and he was just shooting like anytime his colleagues because I think he was a chemist. So anytime mm -hmm. people in the origin of life, you know, genre or field would propose some mechanism, he would just shoot it down and say, no, that couldn't have worked because of this. Right. 
and then it, like he just became known as like Doctor No. That he was, and then I don't know. Like I said, I, he was. I heard him on a, an intelligent design podcast, and he was friendly with. But so I may, maybe he is religious, and maybe he came to that. But anyway, it was, it was just like what you're saying that all these mechanisms, like. And his point was, he said, in the 1950s, if you went and looked at the people working in this field, and then you said, how much progress do you think you guys will make by the year 2024 in terms of explaining where these first, you know, either the first cell or the first building blocks for the first cell, you know, came from in a way that chemically makes sense, they would have thought, oh, well, to have it totally solved by 2024. And he's saying, yeah. and in fact, it's, they're not really any, any further along than they were back then. No, you, you, it's, it's, I'm great, great you mentioned that because that, that brings me to an experiment in the 50s, very famous mm -hmm. experiment, the, experiment, the, the Miller-Urey experiment. Um, you, I'm sure lots of people have heard of that. It's where um, Stanley Miller uh, was trying to recreate that scenario that I just spoke about on the primordial earth. He said, you know, empirical science, let's, let's reproduce it. So he, he got a little terrarium, for lack of a better term. He put water in the bottom to re represent the ocean. He filled it with the gases that were supposed to be on the primordial earth. And he would pass a spark into that enclosed environment to represent the lightning. So he did this for a while, and then he tested the water. And sure enough, there were amino acids in the water. So that part of the experiment worked. He was able to create amino acids. They were a, a little less than 6%. The vast majority of what was of the substance in the water, about 80% was tar, you know, the stuff you pave streets with, toxic mm -hmm. to life. Another 13% was, was, consisted of um, certain acids that would have made life impossible, completely toxic to life. In fact, if Stanley Miller had drank that water, he'd have died. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just so, and, and they tried it many, many times and they were never able to recreate the primordial uh, soup that they talked about to the point where they just stopped doing the experiment. So that just shows right there that even if you, even if you have intel, and this was intelligent people trying to do it and they right. couldn't do it intentionally, yet we're supposed to believe that could happen by accident. Yep. Yep. And it's other examples of this sort of thing too. Um, I'm sure you're familiar, Ed, with the, like Michael Behe's work on irreducible complexity, like the bacterial yeah. flagellum in a saying that, it was understandable in Darwin's day because they just maybe thought the cells were kind of these real simple globs, right. in which case it would make sense. Yeah. If you just had this real simple stuff that was just kind of hanging around cause lightning hit a pond or something, then you could have explained, Oh, eventually millennia down the road, maybe more complex. But if even down at the cellular level, it looks like it was a design. It looks like something the Chinese military would have designed. If you didn't right. know yeah. and it hit any contact, you'd be like, that's a little nanobot. Yeah, and, these, still, these cells are factories. I mean, yeah. They, yeah. So, and I said, going out and then and so to say, okay, tell me a story. How does this thing emerge, you know, incrementally with, with 37 incremental improvements, each one of which was a random mutation that was naturally selected for when you need all 37 things at once or else it doesn't work. Right. It's just baggage on the outside of the cell. And they can't, and then this is my favorite thing in the, in this debate, because I was really into this, like in the mid two thousands mm -hmm. where the biology, the defenders of like the Darwinian, you know, neosynthesis or whatever will say they, their catchphrase was your lack of imagination is not a strike against my theory. And I just said, <laughs> can I use that in economics? Like if I say something and I can't prove how it could possibly work, I can just say, well, the fact that you can't come up with how my story works isn't proof against my story. Like it, like the burden of proof was on my critics to tell me why my story. Yeah. Or anyway, you get what I'm trying to say. No, yeah, I am. But bi biology is the only quote unquote science where you, you can violate the other aspects of science and it's okay that where the, where the, you know, the laws of physics no longer apply. And as you said, it's, it's, it's my burden. No, the burden of proof is no longer on the plaintiff. The burden of proof is on the defendant now. Right. So, right. Said, I have to, I, is not that you have to prove, you don't have to prove your point of view. I have to disprove it. So the burden is on me to prove, right. and of course you can't prove a negative, that's impossible. So it's not on me to, to disprove it. You have to prove how this could actually happen. And I so show me, if, if we have to have all these beneficial accidents happening in a row, because if, if one of the accidents didn't happen right, it's, it's, we're done. I mean, you look at something as complex as our eye, you know, um, it takes so all these different things that had to have happened in either in sequence or all at once in order for us to be able to see if any one of those things about about the eye didn't happen in the right sequence or at the same at the right time we wouldn't 
be able to see. We'd have these, you know, gelatinous orbs in our eyes that would just be in our, in our, in our heads that would just be useless. So that's hundreds, thousands, maybe even trillions of beneficial accidents. I defy you to show me three beneficial accidents that happened in a row. I mean, let's say, you know, I'm walking around through my living room and I trip and fall. And as I fall, I can see under my couch and I see, you know, a dime that I lost. Okay. That's a beneficial accident. I, I tripped, I fell, that was an accident, but Hey, I found some money under my couch. Okay. Now you have to tell me that the next two things I do would also have to be accidents. And they would also have to be beneficial. You can't, you can't demonstrate that. That's not empirical science, let alone hundreds, thousands, trillions of them. And, uh, and, and that's, that's kind of, that, that's just the main issue with, with, with the evolutionary paradigm or the secular paradigm. You can believe it if you want, but you're believing it based on faith. You have to have a lot of faith to believe that. And, and which is fine. You ha as an American, you have the right to believe that. But you can't call it science. It's not science. It's your religion. Mm -hmm. So more and more what I'm coming to the perspective or conclusion of is that in all these different fields, the people investigating thing, again, with the, uh, the mindset of standard neutral science, where we're just going to investigate, we're going to assume the operation of blind mechanical laws of nature and that it's see how far we go. But the more everybody in the various fields keeps pushing that, it, it's they come away with, wow, it it really looks like there were a lot of coincidences in order for things to come out like this. Right. And and so, which again, kind of dovetails with what we were saying at the, at the start of this, where you can go down that path, but then after a while, it, it starts pointing to, it almost seems like, like you could either conclude we're in a giant simulation that intelligent mm -hmm. beings created, or that there was this, you know, thing that created this. There really is a, a material universe that we're in, and our bodies are made up of molecules and things. But that there was some intelligent agent that created all this and designed it in a certain right. way. Because wow, there's just it seems like there's so much information packed into this. Exactly, the origin of life is about the origin of information. You 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 have to get there because again, DNA is information. That's really mm -hmm. what it is. So right now, most high level scientists, if you really get to the highest levels, they don't believe in, in, in the in, in the evolutionary paradigm, as far as it being the, you know, uh, um, um, spontaneous life, you know, um, neogenesis of life, they don't believe that most of them are in two categories. Now, one um, um, is that the if this is more of the panspermia idea that you know, we can't prove that life came from non life here. But it happened someplace else in the universe mm -hmm. and they seeded us somehow either accidentally, maybe a meteor already has some life on it and it fell into the primordial earth and they started, you know, replicating then, or some other intelligence. And again, we're talking about intelligence from someplace else in the universe came in intentionally, uh, seeded and started life here. Okay. But then the question is how, where did their life come from? You know, how did they, well, they, well, maybe they were seeded by someone else, another, more ancient alien. Okay, well, where did how did their life start? Well, they receded. They keep going, but there's no infinite mm -hmm. regression. At some point, there has to be patient zero. At some point, you have to have if you if you are a secularist, you have to have life originating someplace else in the universe. But if you can't prove how it existed, how it came into being in on Earth, how can you prove where it, how it came to existence on planet Xenon twelve? Well, the response is well, maybe back then the the laws of the universe were a little different and allowed for for a, a spontaneous generation of life you have any that's you can believe that but you believe in it based on faith because you don't have any proof that that the laws of the universe were different back when you know the when patient zero um planet on planet zero for life first formed there spontaneously so that's one point of view which again it, it, the further you get into it the further you examine it the less scientific it becomes and the more it becomes a faith-based worldview the other which you mentioned briefly is simulation theory that we are in a simulation and that comes from the whole holo idea of the holographic universe which a lot of scientists believe based on what i talked about at the, at the beginning with you know the, with the with the electrons forming um you know the, these forming these electromagnetic fields that give us the illusion of solidity when in fact we're mo our atoms are mostly empty space so that means that there is a simulate that this is a simulation that was created by another intelligence 
So the question is, if this is a simulation, then it means we're it's simulating something else. That that means that there is a bigger world on top of this world that is being simulated by our physical universe. Which meaning, again, if you go back to the old Star Trek um, uh, shows from the from I grew up on in the in the '90s, um, Star Trek: Next Generation, you have the holodeck, where you have these hard light constructs that people would inter they would interact with that seem very real. That's in essence, what we are, I mean, we are the, we're hard light holograms. So, but, but there was the, the, the ship around it that, sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. But um, that means it was a smaller part of the bigger world, meaning that there's a big, that if we're in a simulation and there's a bigger world around us and above us, that is the real world. And that gets us into the whole speed of light thing that I was talking about on, on Mark's show that we can get into if you want. I, I do want to get into that, uh, but l l let me just pursue yeah. what you just said there mm -hmm. for a little bit more. Yeah. Um, the reason I like the the panspermia thing is because it, I think it shows the intelligent design camp per se really isn't just a Trojan horse for the Bible. Right. That like to say, even though many of the people who like the intelligent design stuff who like might like Michael Behe's work or William Dembski or people like that, they might say, aha, see, so clearly, you know, God exists and created everything. But strictly speaking, you could say, we no, we're just saying there must have been an intelligence in, involved. Right. Strictly speaking, this line of inquiry doesn't prove that it was the God of the Bible. Right. It, in principle, it could be. And the reason I like going down that path, Ed, is because when the standard bi biologists come back and they say, not only are you guys wrong, that's unscientific. That's like explaining thunder by saying the gods are bowling or something. That's crazy. And I want to say, oh, wait, because then I come back and I say, you admit it's logically possible aliens seeded life here, whatever, a billion years ago, right? That could have happened. Mm -hmm. And they say, yes. And they say, so are you telling me, suppose that did happen, that, you know, they designed some super cell in their laboratory and, and, and sent it here, that we can just never know that it's unscientific to even explore that hypothesis that only a priest could talk about that and they you know clearly they have to say no and so right. then i'm showing them okay so how would we ever discover that well if the standard darwinian story clearly just doesn't have enough time in which to operate and maybe if we saw the cells in those creatures from planet xenon 7 they would be little globs and we'd say oh and they wouldn't have complicated eyes and say it'd be un tricky how could they have become intelligent but put that aside maybe you know their bodies are oh yeah that body we could see how it would have arisen through evolution evolutionary processes but you know and then they created in their lab a cell that clearly was designed so anyway i'm just i'd like doing that just yeah. to kind of show when they try to just sweep id off the table is unscientific like to show you can't possibly mean that yeah no i, I i'm with you i think that's yeah it's, it's a great counter because i mean they're they're admitting that they believe in intelligent design they just don't like the designer that is being proposed by Christians, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I when I talk to people about this and I talk to secularists, I don't have any illusion that, and I'll tell them, I, I have no illusion I'm going to convert you today. What I want to do, I want to plant a seed in your mind that's going to just, if you, it's just going to keep, to keep gnawing at you. Mm -hmm. if, you um, if you remember the, the movie, The Matrix that you know came out, but got to feel old, over 20 years ago. <laughs> That one of the things Morpheus says to Neo is that you know you know something is wrong. It's like an itch in your mind. You can't. I'm not quoting. I think exactly. he said a it's splinter. Like, yes, a splinter. Thank you. A splinter mm. in your mind that's driving you crazy. That's what I want to give them. That splinter in their mind It's just going to keep mm. driving you nuts because you have contradictions, and our minds, which is again I think another proof of a creator, our minds cannot process long term contradictions. Contradictions make our brains unhealthy because they can't exist. Contra uh, there's no such thing as a contradiction. It can't exist. I can't be talking to you, Bob, and not talking to you at the same time. That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And if I try to make myself believe that, I'm damaging my brain. So if a biologist says, yes, um, we have a DNA code by accident, he just spoke a contradiction. Right. His mind is not comfortable with that. He's going to do one or two things. He's either, if he's honest, he's going to say, you know what? I've got to explore this contradiction and make it make sense, which will lead him away from the evolutionary paradigm, or he doubles down on it and says, you know what, I know this is a contradiction, and I'm going to just stick to it. And then he's going to become unhinged, he's going to you're going to drive yourself mad. There is a, uh, I'm another scientist I mentioned named uh, George Weld, 
who no, Nobel Prize winner in the 50s, um, also an evolutionist. But he was wise enough to say, or smart enough to say, you know what, we know this isn't true. We know that it can't exist. However, and I'm paraphrasing him, how, however, the alternative to evolution is religion. And I find that distasteful. Therefore, I choose to believe the impossible. He just basically said, I choose to damage my brain because mm -hmm. I don't want to believe in anything supernatural. That's that's distasteful. Therefore, I will intentionally choose to believe what I know is impossible. And, you know, that leads you down the trail of, of, of just becoming a fanatic. And I think the ultimate expression of that, when we look at um, in our recent, rel relatively recent world history, the, the only purely atheistic governments we've had are called communism. You have Stalin and Mao, and what did they do? They killed millions and millions of people. Why? Because if you believe in evolution, then life has no meaning. You know, you mean nothing to me, Bob. You're just, you're just a bunch of beneficial accidents. If I kill you, I've done nothing except, you know, maybe it just eliminates a blob from the universe. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more you go down those roads, the more, you be, the more unhinged you end up becoming. I mean, when you look at, you can look at you know, the biology of Darwinism, which is one thing, but then you have to look at the cultural philosophy of Darwinism and where does it lead to social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is basically I mean, only the fit survive, which that means the unfit have to go. And that justifies things like genocide, it, euthanasia. Why, why would we keep this person who was born paralyzed or with Down syndrome? They have no evolutionary purpose. They're an evolutionary dead end. Get rid of them. And, you know, that leads to, you know, Margaret Sanger and what she, and, and, and her ideas on abortion, not getting into the politics of abortion per se, but what was her, her goal was to eliminate certain races that she saw was unfit, including my race. She was very, she was, you know, very uh, against people of African descent. She, she thought that we were unfit. So the best way to get rid of us is, you know, make sure that no more of us are going to be born. So that type of mentality is the result of where Darwinism takes takes you, and it gets you to you know to really to be unhinged and to and to do some really terrible things, as opposed to a faith based worldview where life is precious, where you know Adam and Eve made in the image of God, and we are in the image of Adam and Eve, and we and we have value, inherent value. And if you have some, if something has inherent value, if you destroy it, then you're destroying value, and you know, so which worldview <laughs> would you prefer to live in? Yeah, great stuff. I agree with you on that. And I was just checking some notes to make sure I didn't miss. But yeah, for example, sure. like John Maynard Keynes was no uh, opponent of eugenics. For you <laughs> know, and and I think a lot of modern day progressives or left liberal types don't un realize the original progressive movement, how big eugenics was, and it totally makes sense from their point of view that hey, if we're going to come in and centrally plan the economy. Why not centrally plan, you know, the the, the human race, and yeah. and lead that to higher perfection too? And and yeah, you, you gotta, you know, if and if you're a communist, right, you're certainly willing to slaughter a bunch of people to perfect society. Exactly. So why yeah. wouldn't you also apply that to you know reproductive patterns and whatnot? So it's it, it's not merely that oh well yeah the, those people did some bad stuff, but the base they, they meant well, and let's just not slaughter people going forward. Let's just okay we learn you know. That no, that the two, it, it wasn't a coincidence that they went hand in hand. And also on this issue, you said something profound there that I want to make sure the listeners don't gloss over that the idea of if, if a secular, you know, atheistic biologist talking about the DNA is a code and how that's a, you said it's a contradiction. And I want to be clear to people, you don't just mean because you happen to not believe in the theory that, that no, because like I just looked up the definition of code and they, and they gave two. And one was to say when you just substitute letters or words for one thing to, to, to engage in secrecy to hide the original meaning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the other, so clearly they can't mean that because otherwise if there's a meaning, you know, and then the other possibility, it said something like um, it, it, an instru instruction uh, program or something like that. It's communication. Yeah. Yeah. And so even, and again, there too, they could say, oh, that's all we mean. Like, you know, the, it, it contains the instructions for how the cell builds a copy of itself. And you say, but why are you using that language? That sounds like there's a plan or there's an intention. Like if, if a billiard ball is moving and you can talk about its momentum and so forth, 
and then it hits another one, you wouldn't say, oh, the billiard ball contained the instructions for how the other ball should move. You wouldn't talk like that. Right. Even though at a fundamental enough level that no, in the DNA, it's just, you know, molecules bouncing around following the blind laws of physics. There's nothing special about DNA that isn't true of a billiard ball if you zoom in far enough. So anyway, I'm, again, I'm just, I'm repeating myself, but just to say that right. to call it a code only makes sense if you think there's a purpose or some meaning. And so they, it's so really the honest atheist biologist should say, you're right. I should stop. It's not really a code. We just use that as a metaphor. It's really not. Yeah. But, about yeah. Th 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 then what is it? Well, right. But I was like, but why yeah. did you keep wanting to say that? Why do you so naturally want to talk about it? Like it's a computer software, it, you know what I mean? And it's a, or it's a blueprint. Like, again, a blueprint is not something that randomly pops out of a tree. It's uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, there's intention. Yeah. Do we, so do you want to get into the speed of light stuff just to give sure. people a little, because um, don't want to be a hypocrite because what I've said, what I said early on is that, you know, it's not, it's, if you propose something, it's your, it's your responsibility to, to give proof for it. And what I've been doing is basically poking holes in a view I don't believe. But I should, I need to give some more more reasons why I believe what I believe, mm -hmm. and I talked before about the simulation theory. So if I believe that what and that there's a, a a bigger world, what what are we simulating? What's what is the real world? And I I should provide a, at least some reason why I I believe that, and so that gets me to and I'm so I'll, I'll give you my my thesis now that I believe that the real world that we're simulating is what we call in in our in the face in our religious faith circles christian circles the spiritual realm that we that this physical realm is a simulation of this of the spiritual realm what is the spiritual realm the spiritual realm well, that, that that would mean that if this is a simulation and the spiritual realm is the more real realm that mm -hmm. our realm is 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 the the, the realm that, that lacks substance for lack of a better term and i so it, and I think I, one of my proof points of that is, is, again, with the model of the atom, that it's mostly nothing. Mm -hmm. So whatever is, is real is more substantive than it. And when we get down to what, we'll talk about speed of light really quick. So speed of light, we, you know, before um, um, Ole Romer, who, who discovered that speed of light, that light had a discrete speed, it, it was assumed that the speed of light was infinite, that mm -hmm. it was just instantaneous. And of course, you know, Romer, um, when he's doing some um, astrological observations of the moons of Jupiter, he, he, he discovers that, you know, light actually has a discrete speed and 186,000 miles per second. And that was the basis of, of, of our modern physics because, because we, we can measure light now and we could, we could start, you know, uh, putting predictive models together. And that's where we get people like, you know, Niels Bohr, Niels Bohr and, and, and Heisenberg and, and all these great physicists, you know, Max Planck, because they could, you know, that's where we get you know, E equals MC squared, you know, C being, being the speed of light. That would be impossible if the speed of light was infinite. So that was the basis of all of our physics is having the speed of light, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the smallest particle last slash wave that we know of. So, you know, fast forward to the, uh, the 1980s, 1988, you have a couple of um, Australian scientists, um, uh, Trevor Norman and um, uh, uh, Denton, who discovered that the speed of light is actually not a constant, but it's, it's slowing down. Um, very, very minute slowdown, not the, nothing that would affect your day-to-day -day life, but they, they, they discovered that, it was, that the slowdown was happening um, predictably and logarithmically, exponentially over time. So the further you go back in time, the fast, the, the faster it was, and the, and, and the more you go forward, the slower, the slower it becomes again at an exponential um, rate. So, what that means is that if you go back a hundred years, you know the speed of light was you know, significantly slower. Again, not so much that you notice it, like your great grandparent wouldn't say, "Well, you know, the speed of light just seems so much slower." They wouldn't have noticed it, but when you when you start adding more and more years to it, it becomes more dramatic. And it's it's the hypothesis is that. If you go back two thousand years to you know the the time of first century, the time of Jesus, the speed of light would have been a hundred times faster than it is today. And if you keep going, it, and again, if that if the, if that rate is is steady, if you get back to go back to say about about eight thousand years ago, which is when we consider the quote unquote ancient times, the speed of light would have been about up to ten thousand times faster. What what is what would that mean? I think it would mean that our world would have looked very different in ancient times. Um, 
we would have, because the electrons would have been spinning faster, we would have had a you know, stronger electromagnetic field. I think that would have meant that, you know, colors would have been brighter. Our, the substance that, we, that we're made of would have been stronger. We might've been bigger and taller. But I also think that mentally, we would have been much smarter because our, our, the way our brains work, when we think, you know, we, there, there's an, an, an electric spark passing between the dendrites, the, the, our, our, neural, our neural cells, the speed of light was much faster than that our thinking would have been much faster. So we would have been, so that would maybe explain where we get all these meth megalithic structures that we can't explain today, like the pyramids, like, you know, Gobekli Tepe and, and, uh, and a lot of those ancient structures, because we had certain abilities that we, that we um, don't have today. I think that one of those abilities we would have had would, would have possibly been to perceive the spiritual realm in a way that we can't perceive it now. And we would have perceived that light of the spiritual realm because the spiritual realm is 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 the, the realm of what i would call i would say consciousness remember when i said at the very beginning god spoke the physical world into existence the vibrations but mm -hmm. the spiritual realm was a thought our thoughts as i just said they're energy that our thoughts are that that spark passing through our physical brain so if we go back far enough in time we there would have been more and more light and it and that that substance what whatever light is would have been more and more prominent so when you get to the spiritual realm the spiritual realm is a realm of pure light it says in the bible that god is light and there's no darkness in him at all so that spiritual realm would have been that realm of just pure light and it would be more solid more real than our world and we would have perceived it better. And so I think the reason that we don't experience the spiritual stuff the way maybe the ancients did when they apparently interacted with spiritual beings that you know we call angels, or I think it's more accurate, accurate to call them the Elohim. Elohim is basically, it's, a, it's a, um, a statement of residency. If you reside in the spiritual realm, you're, you were called Elohim in the Bible. If, you're, if you reside in the material realm, you're called man. And so I think they were able to perceive that spiritual realm much better than we perceive it today. But that realm is the realm of, of light and of energy. And as the speed of light slows down, I believe that the energy that keeps our reality to our physical reality together is also deteriorating at, you know, at, 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 at a measurable and steady rate. Huh? Okay. Very interesting. Um, yeah. And, and this does, it's, it's just funny how this stuff all dovetails that I was just at an economics conference talking about this economist Mises that a bunch of us really like. And, and he has a passage about methodological dualism and mm -hmm. saying in economics, we have to proceed like you know, he was writing this, this was in 1949, but it's obviously still true today that like to explain prices in the marketplace, the economist has to assume that people have preferences, subjective preferences about they you know, prefer some things to others. And like, so you're ex positing the existence of a bunch of minds mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's not just the physical because you wouldn't get anywhere. If you just tried to explain everything in terms of like the laws of physics, you would, you know, you wouldn't get anywhere. And so that's it. So it, it, just, it just keeps, you know, it seems like in many different fields, like we just have this fundamental thing where, yep, there's the conscious, the, our mental processes or whatever. And then there's the corresponding physical stuff that in some cases seems to be related to it, but, there is this chasm or the, these two different worlds at least. And, and that seems real hocus pocus and hippy dippy stuff. But on the other hand, it's like, well, no, but obviously, you know, you feel like you're, you're hearing yourself talk inside your mind and you have, right. you know, you feel like there's something going on that's centered in your body somehow. And it's, you know, no one really can explain that. And so, yeah, you're, if you're trying to link that to have a course or have it be consistent with what we know about the laws of physics that I really like that, that enterprise. <laughs> Yeah, we um we, we have this idea that you know the spiritual realm is this like ethereal, fluffy thing that's not real, but in our world is it's it's a it's a solid world. So if a spiritual being were to manifest in our realm, they'd have to become more solid in order to interact with us. But I think we can see that it's actually the opposite. That that spiritual realm is the real realm. And in order to interact with us, they'd have to become less solid because this is a simulation which means that at the highest level, thought, consciousness, words 
information, vibrations, all these things that are the origin of our physical world are more real than what, what then this table in front of me, this chair I'm sitting on, the, these walls around me. And it, it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it requires a paradigm shift in the way we think, because again, we value the physical, we value what we can see and touch. But when you get down to it, as we've been talking about throughout this episode, the real creative power is information, is words, is vibrations, all of these things that we would consider intangible. Mm -hmm. So the intangible is more real than the tangible. Yeah. Yep. But, and, and that, again, dovetails with what the Bible says. Exactly. That, you know, that God is spirit, that the angels, the Elohim are spirit. And they are the real world because, again, if you when you get down to the, the you know the very end of the book, what happens? Heaven and earth is just is, is passed passes away, and then we dwell with with God forever. So why would why would God take us from a real realm to a less real realm? It, it would seem to be the other way around that He would take us from a lesser realm into a greater realm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we got to wrap it up there on that <laughs> philosophical metaphysical point. Uh, my guest, folks, has been Ed Mabry. Uh, Ed, where where should they go? You you mentioned your website. Do you want to? Yeah, you can go to uh, yeah, you can go to faithbyreason.net is um, the website where I have uh, my blogs, my podcasts, and videos. You can also go to my YouTube channel where I just finished my series on the Book of Revelation, sixty episodes. So it's a really oh, really wow. deep dive there if you're into that sort of thing. I also have a Rumble channel where I've, I'm been starting to put up those same Revelation uh, videos. And yeah, feel free to. Um, subscribe to the the um the website you can put your email in there if you want to have any questions love to hear them if you have any challenges i'd love to do those too because i'm i'm in the process of just of learning more and but again the more i learn the more my my faith is strengthened so i'm, I'm all for it well, well great so thanks so much for your time ed and i'll definitely put links folks so this is bob slash 323 everybody if you want to see the links to where ed just pointed us ed thanks for your time right, fascinating thank you. discussion Great. Have a great one. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.